It's party time here at GB News, not Downing Street. And the pub is open. And Tonya Buxton, celebrity chef and TV presenter and political campaigner and many other things, joins me on Talking Pints. Cheers. Tonya, very good Cheers. I'm gonna sip that. to see you. Now, of course, hmm. my Greek kitchen, my Cypriot kitchen and uh, travel. And I mean, goodness knows how many TV programmes you've presented over the years. Um, you always do it with effervescence and fun. But Thanks. the interesting but the interesting thing is that actually you're an historian. Yes. You're a classicist. That's actually t- what I wanted to do initially before the My Greek Kitchens and the My Cypriot Kitchens. I wanted to do this um, programme called In the Steps of Alexander and following the steps of the Spice Trails of Alexandra and uh, Alexander the Great. And, and it somehow ended up being a food show. <laughs> But, you know, in every single well, one let's of have my a look. shows... Let's have a look okay, at you on the road, look. shall we? Wow. It's nearly it ready. Smells amazing. Yeah. So, here we go. Yeah, no, no. Oh. oh. Lovely jubbly. You know what? I'm in my 40s now. Uh, he's got a lot of faults, Eddie. You know, he's not perfect. <laughs> but one thing he's good at is cooking. <laughs> So classical history out of the window yeah. and suddenly it's travel and it's food. But I was thinking, you know, given that you've studied the classics, that you and Boris have a bit in common. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I floored you with that one. <laughs> I think actually, is it, doesn't uh, Boris have uh, some Turkish origins? Or, uh, in he his, does. His I think, I think a grandfather or a great-grandfather. So, yeah. yes, they, the Ottomans, when they took over Cyprus and Greece, <laughs> maybe when we were polemic even then. But you could have gone on to teaching or whatever, but it's been TV. But mm-hmm. it's particularly... I was a school teacher, though, Nigel. Oh, were you? Yes, I was a school teacher for eight years, a primary school teacher in Tottenham. Wow. Before I changed careers at the age of 32. What is it about Greek food in particular? I mean, what is so special? I mean, and, you know, I know you, you, we, we, we had lunch last year together at a Greek restaurant. It was yeah. magnificent. What is it about Greek food? I mean, you seem to have a, a passion for it, a belief in it. The thing about Greek food is, and what you need to understand, is that everybody talks about the Mediterranean diet. But the yeah. studies that were done on the Mediterranean diet were actually the studies done in Crete in the 1970s. So the Spanish and the Italians and all the other Mediterraneans jumped into this great diet for you. But actually, it was the Greek diet. And it was a lot of olive oil. It's eating off the land. It's eating seasonally, eating colourful food and having a predominantly kind of vegan diet. So it's kind of 80-20 because they eat from nature. And so they might flavour their food with something some salted pork or something like that, but it, it wasn't these great big lumps that you think of when you think of Greek food. You think of souvlaki, don't you? And it's mm. huge amounts of meat. Mm. My parents grew up eating meat maybe once a month, wow. so it's so it's it's a really healthy diet. It's indigenous. Are you saying it's organic? Un- are you saying meat's unhealthy? No, meat is very very good for you. I'm a complete carnivore, but it's where you get your meat from. You know the type of meat that we're eating now, this kind of farmed and and and. It's, it's cruel on the animal and it's actually not good for us at all. They're pumped full of hormones. They've got lots of antibiotics because they don't look after the animal properly. So the fast meat is bad for you. But if you get your meat like I do from a local farm and you know where it comes from, it's very good for you. And you don't have to eat it often. And I buy all of that. I get the argument. I understand it. And yet, difficulty is, Tonya, to eat like that mm-hmm. is expensive. It is. Yeah, it is. So what does... And, and you know, we've got a... A, a massive obesity crisis growing, yeah. not just in this country, but actually right across the world. Although I think when it comes to Europe, we're doing pretty... Because of Europe, we're, we're, we're worse, I think, than, than well, our French and German we're, we're doing badly. The thing is, is the main thing about all of this is to cook from scratch. OK, you cook from scratch. And actually to, to cook... Um, relatively cheaply from scratch. So, And when it comes to getting beans and pulses and learning quite basic recipes, you can feed a family. That, I've got four children. There's six of us. A minimum, I cook a minimum of six. So, you know, it is expensive to, to buy that type of meat. So you don't have it that often. You just have it maybe once a week. And then you find ways to work around it. And it is all about cooking from scratch. But the argument... Even if you're using fats, even if you're using oils, all of that, as long as you start cooking from scratch, you will avoid this obesity. But the working mother- Mum, it, you I know, was a working mum. It, it's coming home and struggling for time. I get that. Uh, I get there's, that. there's a takeaway culture. Mm, that's the problem. Uh, that has absolutely got a grip on 
uh, the minds of many, many millions of people. I mean, you are, when it comes to cooking from scratch, you are talking here about a massive, I guess, a re-education campaign. Well, you know, instead of spending that 400 million that the government did on brainwashing us to be fearful, if they'd spent just half of that teaching people how to cook from scratch and, and looking after themselves, we wouldn't be in the trouble we're in now. That's one of the biggest problems as far as I'm concerned. We've never really... I've been harping on about this for over 25 years. Teach people how to cook from scratch. It's not that difficult. It just takes a little bit more organisation. Mm. And I'm, I'm a working mother. And I worked at the school timetable, which is a long day and it's hard. And I had young children at home and I still managed to get organised. It does take a little bit more effort. But what you get with that effort is huge. Now, you are, you know... Everything you pursue, you do with the most incredible gusto and <laughs> passion. Um, and that really comes into current affairs, mm -hmm. a debate, uh, politics, or on the edge of politics. I don't think of myself as political, but I do think of myself as having to speak up for things that I feel You're are campaigning wrong. at the moment, aren't you? I have been. I've, I was one of the uh, earlier signatories for the uh, Together Declaration, which we took to Downing Street on Monday and handed it over. And it's two declarations, one against vaccine passports, one against vaccine mandates. There were 370,000 signatures on there mm -hmm. because it's immoral, it's illogical, and we have to fight for our children. We have to have freedom of choice in this country. And for me, it's not just about the freedom of choice, it's the illogicalness of these mandates. I think the tide's turning. I, I think, think something has, has changed in the course of the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And I think that argument for freedom of choice, in fact, if you compare us to the rest of Europe, we're leading the way. I mean, the madness in New Zealand... I mean, she's now talking about 24-day lockdowns. I think there are some leaders that have gone insane on power. And this is what COVID's done. It's given people in power too much power. So just, uh, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, it, they've gone insane on power. And they've got to stop what they're doing and listen to their people and, and think about what, what is our humanity about. When people start shouting at me, oh, you don't care about COVID deaths or you this and all the things that I get called, I just stop and say, I want the same as you. We want the best for our children. We're not enemies here. But somewhere along the line, the mindset has changed. And we've got to get people to go back to the old normal and think in the way they used to think before because there has been a mass hypnosis. People are frightened unnecessarily. I think this NHS moment, mm -hmm. you know, we had a paramedic on just a few minutes before you came into the studio. I think this NHS moment is a really big, big battle and a very, very big moment. Uh, do, you think, do you think the NHS staff can win this one? I do, and I think morality will win this one. There we were, clapping our hands for the NHS, mm -hmm. and they didn't know what they were going into. They really didn't know. We didn't know about this virus then. And we were told that this virus doesn't behave like a normal virus, virus does. So we were told to doubt ourselves and be more fearful, and yet they, these people still went to work every single day. And now that they've shown that they are warriors and saving us. And we now know this virus is. We've had the latest ONS uh, results have said that without any comorbidities over the past two years, the people that died of COVID, purely of COVID, mm. were 17,400 people. I, yeah. A flu year. Yeah, I a covered, bad I, flu year. Yeah, I covered this last week. I mean, to be fair, it's not quite a flu year because 17,000 people without underlying conditions mm -hmm. wouldn't have died. But in terms of perspective of closing down the country, of and, doing and all these sucking, things. And sacking these staff that were there. And let's not forget, the big thing for me is that, I, that I've suffered death because of lockdown. My mother-in-law is no longer with us, and no longer alive, no longer here to see her grandchildren because of the lockdown. She didn't get her diagnosis for cancer in time. She kept getting stupid telephone consultations with her dreadful GP, and she is now dead. She is dead because of lockdown, and there are going to be far, far greater deaths because of, because of lockdown than there ever was because mm. of COVID. Well, I'm, I fear that's right. And just finally, a thought. It's the birthday bombshell today. Do these Downing Street parties matter or not? For me, what they show is that no one was scared and that they were playing us. It was a nudge unit to keep us in fear so they could control us. So it says to me that we've got to get rid of the fear. I don't care whether he had parties or not. I just want him to return us back to our old normal.